Hey gang, and welcome back for another video here on Joe Chem. Okay gang, so don't worry about all of that. What we're talking about in this video is we've already touched on, you know, the Fisher, rep the Fisher projection representation of sugars, specifically monosaccharides, but these Fisher projections, you know, while they are convenient to look at, look at, convenient to draw, in actuality, in nature especially, sugars love existing in a cyclic, you know, structure. They love, and while they do represent, you know, bar in a straight chain form some of the time, overwhelmingly, there's an equilibrium that majorly favors the cyclic form of carbohydrates, monosaccharides. So what I want to talk about is, and luckily this is already something you know, all it is is hemiacetal formation, right? So you already know this mechanism, you already know this reaction, but we're just going to apply it to a new scenario than you, you previously did when we talked about aldehydes and ketones, when, you, when we did that chemistry. So if you have a carbohydrate, and right here, for example, we have a one, two, three, four, five, six carbon sugar, aldehyde at the top, it's an aldohexose, it's a D sugar because we know the last carbon at the bottom, farthest away from the top. The OH is on the right hand side. So we know it's a D sugar, and this one in particular is D glucose. Okay? So if we take D glucose, for example, and this only happens with ugh, acidic conditions, right? If we have some acid like H2SO4, for example, something acidic, right? Just like we did in the past, you're going to protonate the carbonyl. That makes the carbonyl you know, more susceptible to nucleophilic attack. It activates the carbonyl, which is this carbonyl up here, because we know this really looks like this. It'll get attacked. I'll show you how that attack works. And then you produce, you know, and we do see two products here. I'll explain why there are two products. Um, two different versions of the cyclic version of D-glucose. And this is also in a confirmation, a form that you haven't seen before called Haworth projections. This video and then one that comes right after it, definitely watch them together, kind of like a, a one, two punch right there. So watch them together because I'll go more into Haworth projections and what they look like and how you draw them and stuff like that. But for this video, I just want to focus on hemiacetal formation, right? So mechanistically, if we actually want to draw what this mechanism looks like, just like we mentioned, the very first step, and I'm going to cheat a little bit because of um, you know limited whiteboard real estate. I'm going to draw sulfuric acid, and again, you don't have to use sulfuric acid; it can be any acid, generic acid, right? The very electronegative carbonyl oxygen is going to get protonated, right? That's what the job of this acid right here. Now, it's very important to note this is going to happen, you know, in equilibrium. So I'm gonna kind of draw the mechanism kind of down and around. So what we have at first is a carbonyl oxygen that now has a plus charge. I'm gonna draw these arrows a little bit smaller. Maybe we'll do them in blue just to keep our things straight. So here's the most important part next, right? Because this mechanism is not very long, it's very short. We only just do one attack. So really the only thing that changed here is I've now protonated the carbonyl oxygen so here's the uh, interesting part. So you can see in the product that, and I tried to denote it here, this is the carbon that's now susceptible to nucleophilic attack. I'm dotting it on purpose, right? Because I dotted this carbon over here. So it's this carbon that gets attacked by a nucleophile. What is that nucleophile? Well, we are forming a one, two, three, four, five, six membered ring. Same thing on the other one. So if we count six away from here, one, two, three, four, five, the thing is, is we don't, you know, we don't go to the end of this chain here. That would give us six and seven. So you might be scratching your head thinking, what's going on? And I don't blame you. What's weird is that it's the alcohol that determines, that, 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 that determines D or L-ness of a sugar. That's the one that does the nucleo nucleophilic attack. It's just six positions away. It's what gets us that sweet, sweet, sweet six member ring confirmation. So in my opinion, here's what I like to do. And you'll get better at doing this in your head the more of these you do. I, for the sake of, you know, just because, and you'll see, especially in the next video when we draw Harvard projections and do more practice with that, 
I like to have my nucleophile on the end of my Fisher projection because that kind of sets it up nicely for drawing your Haworth projection. So what I like to do, this is not an official arrow, but I like to do a double switch. I want to put this OH down here at the bottom. So the first thing I mentally do is I switch these right here, okay? So that would give me I have an OH here. I have my CH2OH on the right-hand side. And remember, this is only a single switch. So what I've just done was invert the stereochemistry of my sugar. And I will not stop here. So I've done that single switch. I've inverted stereochemistry. So then the next thing that I do is I'll switch, you know, I'll switch the hydrogen and this. And I'm just going to do that right here on this step right here. So I'll have a ch 2 OH, and then I just have an H over here. So these two structures are now equivalent. All I did was a double switch around the last carbon right here to get the OH on the bottom. Because now what I can do is attack like this. Elect oh, and I forgot to draw this. It's protonated oxygen. Electrons kick up. This is your hemiacetal formation. This is the step that is super duper amazingly favorable because you go from you know there's a few things you trade you know a pi bond here between carbon and oxygen for a new sigma bond between carbon and oxygen so it's an enthalpic benefit but nature loves six membered rings zero ring strain gives you a guaranteed 109.5 degree bond angles it's intramolecular all these great things going for it so this is when you kind of adopt this Haworth projection which you'll get more of that in the next video but what it essentially is, is you kind of big bad wolf this. You just blow this Fisher projection on its side like this, just like that. So you will, I'll call this carbon number one, two, three, four, five, and six. So this will be carb, uh, oxygen, you know, that's six. Over here is carbon number one. And then I am using kind of thickened lines to because what this projection is really like is you're looking at this, this ring like this, kind of just straight on the side like that. So these are almost supposed to be wedges, if you can you know, picture if that makes a little bit more sense to you. So that's our first carbon, then we have our second carbon, our third, our fourth, and our fifth, and then the sixth. So at first, this sixth oxygen, right, it still has that oxygen there, or sorry, that hydrogen attached. It actually has a positive charge if we're doing the full mechanism. Now, here's the thing. The reason why you get two products here, and I'm going to talk more about this in the next video, is because this is an sp2 trigonal planar carbon. So attack happens equally from on top and on bottom. So this position has a special name called the anomeric position. Again, I'll talk about this again in the next video. So you'll get an equal amount or some, you know, you'll get a mixture of the oxygen, you know, the leaving group being quote unquote up and quote unquote down. So on a Haworth projection, you're either up or you're down on a given position. So what I'll do here is I'll even just use the squiggly, which you will see a lot with carbohydrates to signify you will get a mixture of both, you know, results at that position up and down. Now, if you can think about it, when you tip this thing over on its side, right, everything on the left hand side is quote unquote up because everything over here when I tip this over is still sticking up this way. And on the other hand, Literally, on the other hand, this will go down. So this OH at position two goes down. This position on three is up. This position on four is down. And last but not least, now you'll see why this was so important, right? Is because for five, the CH2OH is up. Okay? And then the last step here would just be a cleanup step. Maybe you have... The conjugate base come back. I don't know. You're going to have something come back, help you deprotonate that oxygen in the ring. And then you will get your product mixture, right? I can draw that line to both of these because this is a squiggle right there. And gang, that is it for, you know, the hemiacetal formation. The points I really want to drive home. This happens in acidic conditions, okay? You need acid for this. If you had a Fischer projection and it was neutral, you wouldn't be doing hemiacetal formation. This equilibrium heavily favors the cyclic form. You will have this like 
like 1%, 0.1%, and this will comprise the rest of your like 99% or 99.999%, whatever. It heavily favors the cyclic. Uh, and yeah, just make sure, you know, we will talk more about Hogwarts projections in the very next video. So if that's something you you came here to learn about, just go to the next video. If you are watching me from YouTube, thank you so much. Make sure to check out joechem.io, you know, the same video, but there's going to be a lovely worksheet attached and answers 100% for free. If you're watching me from Joechem, you're a rock star. And no matter what, I hope to see you all in the next video.